Buddy. So, uh, Dean and Joe, we were just up in the newsroom half an hour ago, and it's like electric up there. There's like mm -hmm. 500 people waiting around, f looking for something to do. Let me ask you. <laughs> <laughs> and waiting and waiting. <laughs> Dean, if we were having this conversation five years from now, right, the, the race is behind us. We've been through the first term of either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. <clears throat> What's the moment from this election and this campaign that stands out and persists in your mind? Two. Can I do two moments? Yeah, you absolutely can. You're my <laughs> boss. You can do as many as you want. Um, for the Democratic Convention, it was the father of the soldier who was killed, Mr. Khan. Sort of conventions are really are tremendously orchestrated. They're sort of, it feels like every second you know what's going to happen. So when he pulled out his copy of the Constitution, it was just a very powerful moment. <laughs> I thought for the Republican convention, it was a bunch of us, including, including Joe, wandered around. And there was a moment when I stood next to the, to the New Jersey delegation when Chris Christie spoke. And there was so much anger in the crowd. I mean, it's, I mean whoever wins the presidency is going to have to deal with a portion of the electorate that's tremendously angry. And there were people holding signs saying, lock her up. And there were people chanting. And you almost had to be on the floor to watch the scene just to get a sense of how powerful it was. And, and that ties into, Joe, something you had mentioned to me, that covering this race has been different from other races because everything has been so, so unexpected. How do you think about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, as we've all seen, the uh, sort of the boundaries of what we had come to know <laughs> as normal political discourse in this election uh, became just so much wider. Uh, and our normal standards of uh, figuring out how to cover a divisive political campaign with, on the one hand, on the other hand, style uh, coverage relying on expert voices to help us navigate uh, some of the complexities in this. In the middle of this campaign, you know, started to feel not quite right. And I, I think w we were pushed to basically innovate and experiment with some new ways of storytelling. For example, uh, just putting a video in the middle of a Trump rally and letting uh, the supporters uh, of Trump speak for themselves a little bit about some of the things that were motivating them, which I think brought alive uh, through video uh, in a very vivid way some of the issues that we were confronting in terms of the anger and the electorate in a way that you know, 50,000 words of, of, of prose might not have captured. And then uh, I think we had a really important moment uh, when, when, uh, when Trump revisited the birther issue uh, in the middle of the campaign. And, and uh, Dean made the decision at that time to come out starting right from the headline and to label that statement a lie uh, and then to take on other falsifications that have, that have happened in this campaign much more directly than we would have done, I think, in the past. So I think it. Uh, you know, only with a lot of debate and only with a certain amount of caution, but I think we pushed into some new territory in terms of political coverage. One of the things that struck me is eight years ago and four years ago, there was a lot of commentary about the fact that Obama and his campaign felt like they could bypass mainstream media. They could talk directly to voters and that this empowered um, the campaigns. I mean, one of the things that's interesting to me in watching this election is that the mainstream media has been at the center of basically every moving part of this campaign. We, we're, the Times in particular has been finding stories about t Donald Trump's taxes. Yeah. We're reporting on what's going on with the emails. It, do, have we learned something about the, the role of media, even in this new age where there's so much ability to talk directly to voters? I, I mean, I feel much more pressure to put reporting front and center. I think that. Um, I think this actually was, and I'm, and, I don't, and I'm just referring to the New York Times, I'm referring to the Post, too, and, and a very small number of other news organizations. <clears throat> I think this was our election. I think that this was an election that defied the news media that relies only on quick opinion. This was the election that defied the news media that sort of didn't go deep and report, and I think this was the election that most required a certain amount of digging that a small handful of news organizations are set up to do. I think this was a, a re the, in that sense, this election was a revelation. What was one of the hardest calls you felt like during the last 18 months? Was there a moment at which you really struggled with? I don't, I don't, I don't think calling him out um, as having told a lie was a struggle, actually. I think that it was. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, it was the it was the it was the perfect moment. I think I could I could feel that our conventions were being challenged. I've never I've never experienced a, a political candidate who very openly and brazenly lies. But I thought on the in the case of the birther issue, which is the issue where we chose to call him out, it was so intentional. It was so beyond the normal pale of political obfuscation where one person says the budget cut is a billion and another person says it's 1.3. He was one of the leaders of the birther movement. He was very open about it. And I, I, I thought, I, I don't think there was another word you could use other than lie. I thought that was an easy call. Was there, was there a conversation inside the <clears throat> newsroom about that? Yeah, there was a, um, Carolyn Ryan, who's the terrific political editor, came to me and she said, we had been talking about it a little bit. I think this is the moment. Trump had just made another statement about it. He, had, he, had, he admitted that Obama was born in the United States. And she said, I think this is the moment. And I said, show me the story. She showed me the story and I said, okay, this is it. Let's put it in the headline. There were parts of the paper, to be honest, where people, we'd never done that. There were parts of the bureaucracy, that, the bureaucracy that keeps us honest, to be frank, where people said, really? Do you want to put lie in the headline? But Joe and me and Matt Purdy and Carolyn just thought it was the perfect moment. In fact, any, any other word I think would have been kind of cowardly. Interesting. So, yeah. Joe, before you became managing editor just recently, you were foreign editor. And one of the interesting things about this race is that we've seen a lot of commentary about the fact that people overseas are watching it very, very acutely. Yeah. Um, you know, and the Times is now a much more global organization than we were 15 or 20 years ago. How, how, do, how do you guys think about covering this race, given that part of our audience are folks for whom the conventions of American democracy are not? Yeah. Well, I'd say okay. actually we, we, got, we got this one a little bit wrong going into it. That's interesting. In the sense that uh, we assume that, uh, you know, of course, for the American audience, we were going to have our normal saturation coverage of, of this presidential race. We do that all the time. It's no different. And we were going to do it even more so this time with visuals and video and every other way of storytelling. And we worried that as we were doing that, we were probably going to alienate our international audience to some degree because we would really be advertising that we're really about America first and not covering it in a way. So we thought of all kinds of workarounds uh, to deal with that. It turns out that our international audience consumed our coverage about this race at pretty much exactly the same rate that they consume our coverage about everything else. Huh. Uh, uh, and all of our travels around the world to gauge how it was performing with the international audience showed that they were at least as addicted to the outcome of uh, learning more about the outcome of this race as the average American. Is everyone leader. else? Yeah. Okay, so, so enough looking backwards. If we're looking forwards, um, <clears throat> we tend to forget that actually what happens tonight is not the end of something. It's actually the beginning of a new, of a new presidency that's going to start in January. For the first 100 days, the first four years, what are the issues that you think are, we're, we're going to see popping up again and again that are going to set the agenda? I think there's a big group of angry Americans um, who felt, not, who not only, by the way, voted for Donald Trump, but who voted for Bernie Sanders, who feel like the present political system doesn't serve them. I think if Hillary Clinton wins, I don't think she can get away with creating a political infrastructure that does not nod to that. I don't think she can come in with the same group of people her husband came in with. And I think if Donald Trump wins, he'll have to deal with a whole other thing. But for us, I think the big story for the next 100 days and year is to understand that group of Americans who were first angry enough in the case of the Democratic primary to vote for a guy who's a socialist and, and in the general election to vote for an extraordinary politician, Donald Trump. I think understanding them is going to be the biggest story we'll have to cover. And this feels like a different <clears throat> moment than four years ago, even in some respects eight years ago. I mean, do you think that this, are, are we seeing a turning point where we're seeing something, a big step back about America? Yeah, I think that the, that the idea, I mean, we've, we've sort of been covering the, the polarization of the American electorate for quite some time. The degree to which the electorate in this country is not in any way even tuning in to the same set of facts, into the same set of political norms, uh, I think has been revealed to us in this election in a way that's just much more vivid than it's You felt can't in the ignore past. it at this point. Right. It's hard to ignore, and I think we have to adapt our coverage 
to cover the whole of America, not just the part of America that normally listens to the New York Times, and we're thinking hard about Absolutely. that. Yeah. So one last question. Um, you guys have both been designing A1 for tomorrow. We, I, you have many mock-ups, I imagine. Um, <laughs> anything you can tell us about, uh, about um, when we pick up the paper on our doorstep tomorrow morning? Because I'm sure everyone here is a <laughs> subscriber, and if not, we've got a phone call, <laughs> a phone number you can dial. What, what should we expect when we look at the paper tomorrow? Uh, the biggest debate is actually over what the headline is. And I'm not going to tell you what the headline is, because I don't know what it's going to be. But the biggest debate is how to craft a headline that, in her case, captures the historic moment of the election of a woman, but doesn't use the word Clinton, because we've already done that. <laughs> <laughs> and in his case, capture ca a headline that captures the extraordinary moment that, that led him to the White House. Your turn. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's the uh, debate we're having, and it's going on back upstairs right now, so. <laughs> we'll let you guys get back up to it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.